hi, I want to spend a little bit of time today thinking about how we can go about teaching graphing and teaching graphs to our students. So I'm Kristen Hunter Thompson. Please feel free to reach out with any questions that you might have. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually encourage you to stop this video and go check out this other video on YouTube. So the, the link is included right here. What's included in this video is a fantastic demonstration of using eye tracking software, the difference between a relative novice, Charlotte, versus an expert, Daniel, her teacher. And what I love about it is that it actually has to do with playing, playing music. So I encourage you to pause this recording, follow this YouTube link to, to, watch, that, to watch that video. It takes about six, seven minutes, and then, and then come back. So what we can see is at the end of the video, there are some graphics that give us a good sense of sort of differences between Charlotte, the novice, versus Daniel, her instructor, the more expert, in terms of time spent looking at music, time spent looking at their hands. The, this graphic gives us a sense of the visual range that Charlotte, the novice, had versus Daniel, which is more stable. And these specific components of these visualizations is not as important as the take home that there's a difference between Charlotte, who's a relative novice, though not as much of a novice as say my first grader who's learning the piano, um, but she's still more of a novice than, Dan than her instructor, um, Daniel. And what I wanna use is this is a great way to lead into thinking about what are some of these differences about how our learners, our students, think about, look at, and make sense of data inside of their heads very differently than we do as experts. So let's explore some of those. So this is work that was summarized by Kristen at University of California, Berkeley, Lawrence Hall of Science. And what I, but let's think about how it applies to data. So one of the big differences is that novices, as they're learning new information, as they're taking information in, Novices often focus on surface attributes, whereas as experts, we notice features and meaningful patterns that are not necessarily often noticed by novices. So what's the data example? So let's say you are doing a unit on climate and the impact of climate on different, the changes in climate on different organisms. So here you are, you're looking at black sea bass. It's a common fish species off of the Eastern seaboard. And what we're looking at is we're looking at the average latitude where the sort of center or average location where every black sea bass that was recorded from a given year was found. And then what we're, so this is a time series, we're looking at time along the, the x-axis, so from the mid-1960s to the mid-2010s. And how this component of the difference between novice and experts often manifests itself is that as experts who are familiar with looking at time series data, even if you know nothing about black sea bass and their average latitude, you can generally look at this graph and see, okay, there's an increasing trend so that over time, over these decades, the average latitude where we find black sea bass has increased. Yes, there, there's variability, there's up and down, but the general trend is that there's been an increase in the latitude that we find them at. Whereas our novices get really stuck on this, it goes up and down. And it's not their fault, right? That's the surface attribute. There are high points and there are low points and there are high points and there are low points. And it gets hard for them to kind of in essence, sort of blur their vision of those surface attributes to see, to see the overall trend. Another component of a difference between novice and experts is that novices don't chunk their information. They, instead, they memorize or sort of remember individual different pieces. So in their brain, it sort of works as a list of facts and laws. And so they're not certain kind of which fact or law or anecdote or component or piece that they read somewhere or something that their instructor told them at some point. Um, they don't know what to pull for the context that they're in. Whereas as experts, we've organized our knowledge and our information inside of our heads around these big ideas that guides our thinking. And so when we approach a new problem and we're asked something new, we can we can use that organization of those big ideas to think about, okay, well, what do I need and what, what should I pull to use from to be able to answer this question or problem put it in front of me? 
How we see this getting manifested in itself with data is um, as, as experts that have worked with data and understand data, we often default to an understanding that if we're looking at a time series of data, the first visualization that we should go for to look at our data as we're doing exploratory data analysis is to make a line chart, right? So that we can actually see sort of how are the different points in time connected to one another to get a, an initial sense. Whereas our novices often will do things like selecting a bar chart because they really like bar charts and and it's easy and they don't have that knowledge of oh wait my data is a time series and so i'm looking at changes over time therefore maybe i should look at it in a line chart first and finally another component is that because as experts we have this information organized around these big ideas we can flexibly and selectively retrieve information Whereas, our, whereas novices are just sort of left without any structure or system to understand what kind of information they need to solve the problem at hand. And so this, is, this, relate, this results in what I often call the Rolodexing effect, which is entertaining because I'm not sure how many of our learners know what a Rolodex is anymore. Um, but in essence, their brain is just sort of twirling through a variety of different facts and pieces of information that they have and just sort of grasping at different components inside of their brain, as opposed to we can think about, oh, okay, wait, so this has to do with time. So let me like think about all the other previous experiences where I've worked with time data and what did I use then and use that to inform the choices that we're making. And these differences I want to note between novices and experts have to do with how our brain develops and processes new information. So these are things that we are taking in as, as we learn new information throughout our entire lives. This is the iterative process about how we build mastery and competence and ability within new fields is that we, we all start as novices and over time and practice and iteration, we move more into this expert side of our ability to work with data. But we need that repeated time and iteration and ability to engage in that work ourselves to think to move our brains from sort of this novice side to the expert side of how we organize information. So that's a layer that's going on when we think about incorporating data overall into our teaching, but it has a big impact as I've shown here with these data examples about how our students actually build out their graphs and um, design their graphs and make their they can iterate their graphs. So let's explore that a little bit more. Before we get there, I want to talk about the big elephant in the room or the question that I'm so often asked of like, should our students be graphing by hand or should they be using technology? So here are the, is the exact same data set, one as students have graphed it by hand and one by technology. And like most things in life, there's no clear cut answer, but instead there are benefits and challenges of the two different ways. So graphing by hand, some benefits are that the students have more of a personal connection to the data it's a small data set. There's just only so many data points a student can actually graph by hand. And there's this physical hand brain connection for our students when they're actually physically plotting themselves the data points onto a graph. The challenges are right that it can be really time consuming to get our students to, to graph these data. And there's varying levels of abilities in our students about how they're able to make a graph that both come from their knowledge and understanding of what it takes to make a graph and two comes from how their brains are functioning and where they are, are on that novice to expert spectrum of being able to make graphs and understand what they need to do when they make a graph. So a lot of people herald technology as this like great way and we should use it across the board. And there are certainly lots of benefits of using technology when making graphs. Like it takes a lot less time to make the graph, right? The, the computer or software program or, or online platform does it for you. So you can also use much larger data sets because the computer or the program is doing it for you. You can more quickly graph your data in different ways rather than like, graphing it by a line chart and then having to start all over again to make that bar chart by hand, it's usually just a click of a button to change between different graph types as we're iterating our graphs and exploring our data and data exploratory data analysis. Um, so that it's easy to iterate 
And the reality is, is that very few students will ever have to graph a graph by hand in their job after they leave the K to 12 space. So this is actually a workforce readiness skill of teaching our students how to interact with uh, graphing programs so that they can produce graphs sort of across the board, kind of regardless of what um, field they go into, the more and more fields are requiring uh, requiring our workers to at least make sense of graphs that are provided to them or make graphs themselves. But there are some real challenges that exist with making graphs with technology. So it requires a Chromebook or a laptop or whatever piece of technology that you are using and that thing needs to be charged, right? Which is no small feat when you have a class of 20, 30 plus students. Um, that technology and access to it can be unreliable, especially if we're using online platforms or even computer-based software programs that have run out of date and then they need to be updated. We have our firewalls and different things like that. There's also the real reality that sometimes you have to teach the technology, that students don't, although they are very tech savvy in many ways, they may not understand the technology of the specific software platform, computer program, et cetera, that we're using. Um, and then tech is updated in ways that don't make sense or typically like it is, you know, an update goes through post you making your lesson plan to you actually being in the in person with your students. So there are benefits and challenges to these different ways of making graphs. And, and I'm going to posit that rather than thinking of this as an either or, we can think of this as a transition so that in the elementary school ages, our students are predominantly the vast majority of the graphs they're making they're making by hand when that physical like eye hand coordination is so key for our students development and in middle school we can start this transition where our students are both graphing by hand and graphing with technology and then as our students progress and move into high school they're doing more and more graphing with technology this progression also overlays nicely with the complexity and size of the data sets that our students are using and the kinds of the kinds of and complexity of the questions that they're asking of the data. So as our data sets get bigger, as our questions get more complex, we can use technology more and more to help our students so that by the time they graduate and are going out into the workforce or going on to higher education, they're ready, they have those skills. They have the grounding in graphing by hand. So they get the benefits of both in essence by thinking of this as a progression rather than an either or. So I just wanna spend a few minutes of like, when they actually come to making the graph, what are some key things that would be good to think about? And so here is a graph of the budget in millions of dollars, US dollars across the year of DreamWorks videos and Pixar videos. Okay, so this is probably a topic area that you do not cover it with your students, but that's okay because we can use it as an example. So the title here is movie budgets by year, which if we think about actually doesn't really tell us very much because we already have movie budget as our label as our label of the y axis and year as our label of the x axis. But this is so often what I see and encounter when students are working with graphs is that we provide them with graphs that have titles like this and we are asking them to give us titles like this that include the variables. But let's let's dive a little bit into more of like when we should use be using what kind of titles on our graphs. So when we just include the data variables like we saw in that last graph, it's for things like this, where well, this is a New York Times graphic of that's an interactive graph. And here we're really in the exploratory data analysis stage. So it's important to get a sense of what the variables are. Notice actually that they're included here in the title rather than included as access labels because that would be redundant. But it's, it's this invitation in to come explore the data. These are the variables you have. Figure out what's going on. Play around with it. Explore with it. This can be done either in an interactive way, as this New York Times feature is, and I highly recommend going to check it out, or as a static graph, right? If we're inviting our students in to explore and make meaning, then listing the variables is fine. But the thing is, is that once we come, once we've made sense of our graph, which is often what we have our students do, right? When they've looked at a graph or they've made a graph, and then they're making a claim from that graph, we need, the title works far better when it actually explains details of the interpretation of the data. Because we've interpreted it, we've made a claim from those data, we should stake, you know, 
put a flag in it, like stake our claim of like what it is we have found from those data. And that's what moves us into the explanatory data analysis phase where we're like, I've done it, I've interpreted it, I've made a meaning from it, and this is what the data show. So I put it out there for you to think about more strategically of when we're having our students put titles on our graphs that are just about the data variables versus when are we asking them to provide a title that has details of the, their interpretation of the data. And this is helpful in two ways. One, it helps them get a sense of like, what actually is my claim? You very quickly see their claim because their claim is in the title of their graph and that it, and it shows the context for that claim. Okay, so rather than just relisting the variables which are already included on the axis, on the axes, if our students are labeling their axes, let's, let's, let's push them sort of outside their comfort zone of being like, if you are giving me a graph with a claim that you're making from it, if we're doing our CER, your you should tell me that claim up front and center. So a few other things to think about when it comes to making graphs. So the, the axes should certainly be labeled and they should be labeled with a detail to know what the variable and units are. And the units should be included in parentheses. And that's because somebody should be able to come in and look at your graph and immediately start making sense of the data. They shouldn't need to look at a figure legend. They shouldn't need to look at other things like that. They should have enough understanding of what variables you've chosen to put in your graph. Uh, a legend of how things are oriented in your graph, so different than like a figure legend we include in a lab report or a paper, um, a legend is a great place to make it easy as possible for people to understand the differences between your data. So here are the differences between the colors of these different dots that I'm showing. You could also just label the dots directly, uh, and that's another way that is easy to, to label the graphs. How to do this? The easiest thing is to drop in a text box, be it Excel or Google Sheets or things or things like that, if you want to actually physically annotate and label, label the data points directly. So this is another component of like making graphs is it sort of becomes a hodgepodge of like how I'm making the graph and then how I'm making the graph best communicate what my claim is from the data. Again, which is what we predominantly are asking our students to do with their graphs. Other things to think about in terms of making graphs that are more easy to interpret and understand for the reader <coughs> and elevating up the professionalism of them is that the y-axis ticks marks and the x-axis tick marks should be labeled with a range large enough to cover the full range of collected or potentially collected data points, right? It, the range that we use on our axis should be relevant to the data that we have. So, if it's interesting that you only collected data points between zero and five hertz, but you were expecting something in the zero to you know, 50 hertz range, then it might be worth making your, making your tick marks all the way up to 50 hertz, just so that you can, so that it's really clear that the data you collected was far less than what you were anticipating. So that's what I mean by potential data that you've collected. Um, also think about, that, so what this means is that the origin doesn't always have to be at zero, zero, the way our students often learn in math class, because when we're using data from the real world, our data, are, they, our data have a context. And so it would make no sense for us to look at this time series graph and start it at zero and go up to 2014, because our data only range from, it looks like, actually 1995 to 2014. And so this origin does not have to be anchored at zero, zero. Instead, it should be context specific to the data we have. And then finally, just a few other things, like it can be really helpful to bold our access lines. It can be helpful to have no background color in the plotting area. Unless it's needed for analysis, those horizontal and sometimes vertical lines that show up, they're called grid lines in our plotting area, research has shown can actually be distracting for readers when they're making sense of the graph. So if it's an important component for analyzing or interpreting, making sense of the data, then by all means keep them, but don't keep them just because they're the default of many graphing platforms. Um, some things to keep in mind is that our title should be at least 28 point font, our access labels 20 point font, tick labels 14 point font. These are all things that you're going 
that your students can evolve and make their own conclusion. The sense is just to kind of make things stand out that you really want people to look at. If you want more information of how, of sort of when to include different graphs or how to teach about what a graph should look like when they're making claims or a rubric that you can use to, um, to grade or provide feedback to students on their graphs, then check out more resources by following this tiny URL. Finally, there's one last thing that I want us to think about is that when we're looking at graphs, um, it's different than we're look when we're looking at prose. So when we read in the Western Hemisphere, we read from top to bottom and from left to right. And as our students learn how to read, we can generally presume that they are following this structure or this process of top to bottom, left to right as they're reading a set of prose. However, when we look at visualizations, there's no one way to look at it. And this is one random eye tracking that I did looking, looking at a graph. Um, but this varies by the age of, of the reader looking at it. It varies by how tired you are. It varies by what mood you're in. It varies by a wide range of things. Um, and I share this just because sometimes I find that there's a lot of focus on like, well, I'm gonna teach them that they have to look at the title first and then the axes. And the reality is, is our research shows us that even, even our learners that have been really strongly told what to look at first, don't. They look where their eyes are gonna look and then they go to look at, to where they've been told. So I, I bring this up in two ways. One, as you are working with grass and showing your students grass, I encourage you not to say things like, as you can see in the graph, because every might, everyone might be looking someplace different in the graph. And then two, to sort of open it up a little bit about how we are encouraging our students to make sense of a graph, recognizing that we all, we all look at it differently and make sense of it differently, or at least in different orders initially. And this is a subconscious thing that we do. So that was sort of some quick tips and tricks about how to help how to incorporate graphing and teaching graphs and what are how to help our students make their graphs. If you have, as always, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. And with that, I thank you. Have a good day.